Our next guest wrote a scathing op-ed saying the Brussels bombings show just how wrong Donald Trump is to say that NATO is obsolete. Trump had called uh, NATO just that. Admiral James Stavridis, a former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, good enough to join us now. Uh, thank you, Admiral, for your time. I do want to ask you about that op-ed in which you said, and I quote, Trump would sow the seeds of global instability and seed significant portions of the world to regional domination. All of this would undermine the global economy and diminish U.S. power. Admiral, very powerful statements. Can you further explain them? I can. Uh, let's look at the importance of global security organizations, and let's take NATO as an example. That transatlantic link that connects the United States with the other 26 European members of NATO is crucial. If the United States were to disengage or, as Mr. Trump is advocate, renegotiate its contract with NATO, whatever that means, it will undermine confidence in Europe and open that space to further encrosion by Russia, resurgent power. Using that model to apply to nations in Asia, where we have strong allies like Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and so forth, same pertains. So my concern is that any kind of retreat from the world is going to lead to more instability. That's a real challenge for the United States. Well, you know, what Donald Trump also says is uh, we're simply not getting a bang for the buck, that we're contributing more money than any other country, mm -hmm. and we're not in the same financial position that we were when NATO first started. So maybe that's another reason to pull back. What do you say? Emory, there's a grain of truth in that, and it's quite simple. Let's do the numbers. The United States spends $600 billion a year on defense. Our European colleagues spend $300 billion a year, quite a bit. That's more than Russia and China combined. Now, does it meet the 2% of GDP goal that we have set collectively in the alliance? It does not. But the point is, it's still an extremely significant contribution. We ought to be encouraging NATO to spend more, but that's different than saying we're going to renegotiate the contract and potentially withdraw our leadership from NATO. That would be a crucial mistake. With, uh, with regard to then the global communication and cooperation we do see because of multilateral organizations such as NATO, I do want to ask you as well about the terror attacks uh, in, in Brussels. Admiral, Interpol had Khalid El Bakrawi on a watch list before the attacks in Belgium. Turkey had, in fact, stopped his brother Ibrahim uh, from crossing the border into Syria just this past summer. And the police in Brussels actually had Najem Lashraoui on a watch list as well. These are massive communication failures, if nothing else. What do you see that happened here? Josh, I think you've got it right. And as we look across the Atlantic at Europe, we ought to try and imagine the United States with each of the states in the United States speaking a different language, having a thousand years of history, having different major legal norms, different Supreme Court rulings. When you put all that together, you can see the difficulty of that kind of connection. That's an argument for multilateral cooperation. We've got to elevate it. The U.S. has to be in a leadership position to energize that. I think that's the appropriate role for us. What do you say about the fact that, you know, many of these men were raised in Belgium. They spent their entire lives in Belgium. I mean, how much of this is partially a homegrown problem as well? It absolutely is, Anne-Marie. And these banlieues, these suburbs around Paris, for example, are really the epicenter of this. And that will only become overcome by playing the long game, by using the tools of what some call soft power, education, opportunity, assimilation. That has to be part of what happens in Europe, and we need that here in the United States as well. That's the long game. In the short term, you need the hard power, the surveillance, the cooperation we've talked about. The long game is on the soft power side to assimilate those communities. To that point, Belgian authorities have come under a firestorm of criticism with regard to uh, their own failures, uh, policing their own communities. You are a former resident of this city. What's your sense of that disconnect between uh, uh, the Muslim community of Brussels and perhaps the city proper? I think within uh, the, the nation of Brussels, Josh, you have a, a kind of a microcosm of Europe, in a sense. As you probably know, the nation is divided sharply between its French-speaking South 
and it's uh, Flemish speaking, like Dutch, north, has small German community in the east. It has those kinds of integrating challenges that we discussed a moment ago. So Belgium is particularly vulnerable to this, and because of all of that, they have not done a particularly good job of assimilating even those European cultures, let alone the Muslim that is there as well. You mentioned that Belgium has a particular vulnerabilities. What do you make of the overall international reaction to the, the terror attacks on Tuesday? I think it's appropriate. And, and here you need to think about population adjusting your mentality. In other words, Belgium is a nation of only 10 million people. To have 34 killed, 200 plus badly injured, starts to approach a 9-11 level event. I think people realize that we need to put our collective work together internationally within our inner agencies, and indeed we need private public cooperation. It's integration that is going to solve this problem, not building walls. Admiral, you mentioned in the short term that hard power. Uh, Syrian forces are now massing to attempt to retake uh, the ancient city of Palmyra from ISIS as Iraq forces begin what is sure to be a, a long effort to uh, retake Mosul, but we're starting to see perhaps some signs uh, of, uh, of that tide turning in Iraq. What is your thought about the United States lending further assistance to these forces? Josh, I think you've categorized it correctly, but I'll put it this way. In terms of Iraq, it's a, almost a pure hard power solution. We've got to retake Mosul, cut off the supply lines going into Syria, amp up the bombing campaign, help the Iraqi security forces come up from the south, the Kurds come from the north, and take that piece off the table for the Islamic State. In Syria, different story. At the end, it's going to need to be a political diplomatic solution. I think that anything that defeats the Islamic State is a first order good. But long term in Syria, it needs to be solved much as the Balkans were 20 years ago at a negotiating table. So two complex situations, they feed together. The key takeaway is that we're learning that ISIS militarily in the region is not 10 feet tall. All right, Admiral James Stravides, thank you very much. Thanks, Anne-Marie and Josh.